All right. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our fiscal year end meeting for redesign for 2022. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'll be starting off with the um, USSR portion, and then um, Lori's going to hop on for the USPS part. Okay, so um, I'm starting on our main page as per usual um, for the materials for fiscal year end. Hopefully, um, you know, you may have already been out here and found them, but just in case, I'm scrolling down to the SSDT meetings and trainings. Once I click on this page, I have, this is where you would usually go to um, the ITC registration page. That's probably where you signed up for the session today. Um, but on this first page, we have um, some links to some very helpful pages in here. Um, right here, redesign, we have the fiscal year end materials. So this is where I'm going to go in a second. Um, but I do, while we're here, just want to point out the other things on this page. Uh, the beginner training, we did do this a couple months ago. Um, that has a lot of information on that page. So um, that may be something to revisit. And then the release recaps, we're doing our monthly recaps and kind of compiling all of the information for USAS, USPS, and inventory. And those pages can be found down here. Um, but let's go to our fiscal year end information. And here we have everything compiled. This is the presentation that I'm gonna go through today. Here is the checklist that is in the wiki um, and then some supporting documentation. So the setting estimates versus actual variances, this is like the classic set bow, if anybody asks for that for year end. Um, and then budgeting scenario steps, we'll mention budgeting along the way of our um, USAS discussion today. So just kind of a nice place to have everything together. And, you know, and here are the USPS links as well, um, kind of compiled for you. We're trying also to, you know, make sure these are linked, uh, you know, in, in a helpful way. So like this fiscal year and checklist, I'm going to go here real quick. This actually goes to the page in our appendix. So if this is updated in the wiki, you have the updated link to the copy right from that page. Um, and then our fiscal year end review, this goes right to our PowerPoint. And um, so I'm going to go ahead and kick off here. And uh, let's see, let me make this a little bigger for you. So the very first page of um, our presentation is just talking about where you can find these things. Here's a direct link to the meetings and trainings page um, right from this PowerPoint. So jumping right in here, um, here are some things that you can consider prior to fiscal year end. So these are kind of just like suggestions, things to start thinking about, um, not, you know, like necessarily things they have to do, um, but just some helpful um, items that we that we put in here. So the first thing is closing out all possible purchase orders. Now, the reason to think about this is that when the fiscal year end gets closed, any of those outstanding encumbrances, the remaining encumbrances, those are going to roll over and become the prior year encumbrances on their accounts. So if they have a lot of purchase orders that are old, outstanding, that they don't need anymore, you know, those could be playing into their balances. So if they want to go back and review, close out old purchase orders so that those don't play a factor, that's kind of like a good practices thing. Um, I did link this right here to our FAQ. We have a section about purchase orders and the different ways to close those. So um, if you if that's something that your districts are wanting to do, that's a good place to start. Reviewing old outstanding disbursements. So this one's on here because one of their uh, reports that they probably run probably a month then, maybe, you know, definitely at year end, is going to be the disbursement, like probably like an outstanding disbursement summary. And, you know, they're using that likely to compare to the bank, um, the bank statements and help them balance. And so if there are old outstanding disbursements that maybe could be reconciled, then that may really help that report be a lot more clear. Um, the other thing is that um, memo checks from Classic, you know, those may have come over as not reconciled and now they could reconcile those 
to get them off their reports in um, redesign. And that specific situation is addressed in this FAQ um, section of the disbursements. So I think it's one of the later ones in the disbursement section. So um, click this link and scroll down just a little bit and there's a screenshot and everything to um, help with cleaning that up if that's something that they choose to do. Um, add or customize monthly report bundles. And this could also go for like fiscal year end report bundles. So actually we've gotten um, some tickets lately. I've seen some instances. It looks like people are really using these monthly report bundles and that's very awesome. So, you know, if they already have monthly items set up that they're good with, you know, this isn't necessarily saying that they need to add more. Um, but if a district isn't really, you know, fully utilizing this yet, this is something that can be very helpful. Um, at the end of the month, at the end of the fiscal year, we have the SSDT uh, bundles that run a certain you know, set of reports that sends to the month, monthly archive, but um, they are able to set up custom bundles with reports of their choosing, and they could either send those to the file archive in addition to the standard reports, um, or they could have those emailed to certain people in the district. So this uh, links to our appendix walkthrough that goes through how to do that. Um, and then, you know, if we're talking about fiscal year end, there is a way they could have it set so when the fiscal year closes, reports go um, on that event instead. So that would be, if that's something they want to do, that would be nice to set up. You could set that up ahead of time, set that up now. So then when that close happens, it's going to automatically kick off those bundles. Um, and then the last one that we have on here, just for our consideration, is maintenance of effort. So um, maintenance of effort, and um, I have the link here to a budget summary that the budget summary MOE, which is in the template reports. Um, but let me go ahead and flip over to my next slide here. So maintenance of effort. So prior to funding, um, ODE compares the districts like local and um, or state and local expenditures. Um, to ensure that they um, expend at least the same amount as the previous year. So um, basically, when, after they do their um, you know, EMIS reporting, this is something that's looked at and um, they look at you know, specific account codes related to this. So what this report does, it's a budget summary that basically filters it down um, to, to specific accounts that they need to look at for this. So it's, this is just kind of like a, hey, check these out ahead of time so that you're not surprised, you know, when it's re reported or, you know, when it's reported later, um, you know, it gives them a chance to review and um, adjust if needed. So let me switch over to my instance here. So I'm in USAS. So um, if I go ahead, I'm going to show all my reports here and scroll just a little. So the budget summary MOE. So this is the template report. And um, you know what? Actually, let me go back. This is where I intended to go is um, I wanted to actually click on this. So this is the link in the documentation. Here's where it shows uh, what's included in that MOE report. Um, now, the way that we have this set up to, um, to happen in redesign is that it's, it's um, this report, this template report is built to automatically pull that, but it's actually using a report filter. So um, we've made some enhancements, you know, to that budget summary report, especially for districts with large charts of accounts, they might be wanting to use the canned report instead. And so if they want to use this canned report, they absolutely still can. Um, you would just come in here and if you type, oh my God, my caps lock on, but type SSDT, this MOE filter is going to get them the report. That'll be the MOE version. Let me turn my caps lock off. Okay. Um, so let's see. Let's go back to here. Okay, oh, sorry, my PowerPoint, a little out of whack there. Okay, 
All right. So, so that's, um, so that's just like a suggestion that they can review ahead of time. Um, now, here are the things within the system. Um, these are on the checklist, things that you can do now prior to fiscal year end. So this first step is verifying data. We're going to go through and talk about each of these, the district and building information, if the accounts are valid, uh, EMIS fund change categories, the OPUs, and um, actually, I should probably update this inventory we will talk about um, next week. So um, we did separate off that session, so I'm not going to talk about inventory today. Um, and then um, preparing next year budgets and revenues and um, preparing requisitions for next year. All right, so now, so these are like, now we're officially on, like I said, these are on the checklist. This is the pre-closing procedures. This first thing here is looking at the organization detail. So there, um, th this first set of information that we're talking about, uh, this page and with the building profiles, those are going to get pulled in the EMIS extract. And so those are things that are used for the um, financial reporting. Um, so this first one organization detail on that core organization setup page. This is kind of like their general information with their district name, the district address. At the very bottom, there's a spot for central office square footage. We do have this as something, you know, that generally you would check year to year. If they migrated within this year, we usually suggest checking this when they migrate over. So likely this is populated year to year this likely doesn't change but you know sometimes they do they change offices they um, maybe like expanded their office and so this is something that every year it's good to check and make sure this central office square footage is accurate um the itc irn this used to go in the emis extract it was just updated though they no longer want it in the extract um you know this year so this itc irn field they can fill it out it can be there for reference, but it's not required. It's not going to pull in the EMIS extract. So it's completely up to them whether, um, you know, that, that can be tracked in their system or not. It um, could go either way. The district building profiles. So this is going to be under the periodic menu. And on this page, what they would do is they would um, enter or like review and update um, basically their buildings, the square footage of the buildings, the transportation percentage, and the lunch room percentage. Um, again, these are things that um, are included in that EMIS extract and they're used for certain estimates, you know, with their financial reporting. Um, sometimes they use this information. So, um, I know this is pretty straightforward, but I like showing these. I feel like it's nice to see in the software too. So I'm going to periodic and building profiles right on that second one right there. And so you have your grid and, you know, these, these rows, it'll vary, you know, per district. So each, each school, if they have, you know, more buildings, if they have more elementary schools, they'll have um, a line in the grid for each of those the square footage. And then when it comes to the transportation percentage and the lunchroom percentage, these, it can, it's basically like spreading out like where their transportation and lunchroom, like um, what levels they fall throughout the district. So basically these are always gonna add up to a hundred. So I want it to be a hundred percent spread out across all buildings. So, you know, this I'm saying the high school transportation um, is 50%. And then, you know, I have 15, 10, and 25 to my other buildings. So that would equal 100%. Um, so those for both of these columns should add up. I also have uh, in my report manager, report name district in there. So a district building information report. This is super simple, but you know, maybe if they have somebody at the district, like, you know, the, the somebody who um, helps with EMIS, you know, maybe the EMIS coordinator does this or like the assistant treasurer does this and they just want to say, check, this is done for the year um, and keep a record of it. Here's a quick little report they could run, you know, and then make sure that everyone's on the same page with that. Um, 
of course not necessary, but uh, just a nice uh, condensed way to see this information should they want it. All right. And here's the report. So the next thing is this account validation report. And basically this is a way to um, help them ensure that they have no valid account code dimensions prior to the data collector check. Because if there are uh, account codes that they have that are not valid anymore. So, you know, I mean, in um, per ODE, there are like certain codes, there are certain guidelines for, you know, what codes are valid each year and then like which, which ones you can use with other ones. And um, so basically, this report helps them do a pre-check on their accounts for what's going to get reported um, to try and you know help avoid errors later when they get to the stage where they're submitting through the data collector. Okay, and so let's go, actually I'm just going to clear this out because I think it's at the start here. So this account validation report going to go ahead and run this real quick. Hopefully. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, I clicked the wrong right one. All right. So let's go back to the PowerPoint real quick then since that, that wants to take a minute. Um, so he, on this next page, on this next slide, we have some examples of the possible EMIS errors. So like you know, it will tell you if it's not a valid fund code, function object, um, you know, if there needs to be more detail in the code so that, you know, some part of the code, um, some part of the code may uh, need to be like defined further. Um, and oh, I'm sorry, I see Brenda put a chat here and I think I missed it. Um, they can check on the report button on the grid and um, it'll give you the totals. So. Um, I think that was for the building and district information. So that's a good tip as well. And then I have one more page here. Um, and then, so this one um, in regards to the account validation, um, other warning messages that can happen in the data collector we have here. Um, and then um, just, you know, if there are level one or two fatal errors and the district has closed the fiscal year, June can be reopened to make any necessary changes. So really what we're doing with this account validation report, it's kind of just the very first step of trying to, you know, clean anything up to make that um, as easy as possible once they get to, to that submission step. Uh, let me go back here. Okay, so here's our account validation report. And um, we just have this option like include, include account, or I'm sorry, exclude accounts with zero amounts. But I'm just going to run it. I'm just going to run it for everything. Okay. So um, here's what this looks like. And we had a little screenshot in there, but it's kind of nice to see the full thing here is it's going to give me an account code and then give me what the validation message is. So, and it's kind of in order here. So these are cash accounts, you know, and then it moves on. Um, but so, so if I look at um, this, this uh, cash account, it's saying 494 is not a valid fund code. So what they can do is kind of go through this and take a look at these accounts. Um, so if I just go to the core, the cash account, and it's 494. And um, this 9980 here, I could go ahead and um, pull this up and then inactivate that and um, clean that up on my report. Um, now, when it comes to the expenditure accounts, so we have all of these on here and they're not a valid code. If it has charges to it in the year, then it's not just as simple as like, oh, okay, like I'm gonna inactivate it. Like there's actually information that they need 
on there. And um, if that is the case, then um, get back to my um, PowerPoint here. If that is the case, then um, what they can do is they can use the account change instead. And so the account changes under utilities, they would go in here, they would pick the from account, the account that's showing up that they need to change, and then pick an account to change it to. And that will um, update the transactions as well related for the fiscal year and move those over to the new account and inactivate the old one. All right, so that brings us to the EMIS fund categories. Now, what this is, is um, it can be found on the cash record. So, you know, we were just looking on that grid and um, it's a ODE brief description. This, um, there's a section in the EMIS manual about this that gives the EMIS fund categories. And uh, basically, it was just like an additional description that's you know been reported to EMIS throughout time. Um, when we switched over to redesign, this was something we kind of investigated because um, and we really hadn't like you know necessarily heard if uh, this is something they're they're using basically because um, it wasn't doing it wasn't providing a fatal error if it was missing. So this is something we've kind of questioned for a while. It is there's a field available for it in the standard custom fields. Um, you know, they can enter these codes in there. For this year, what I'd say is, you know, I mean, it, it seems like it's optional, you know, so they can fill these out. Um, it is still getting reported this year. We still have no answer on like, you know, it, it wasn't like a fatal or anything. What we have heard is that it's, it's not getting reported next year. So for fiscal year 23 financial reporting, it's set to be removed. So here's a link on their website. This shows where it's said to be updated in the EMIS manual. So it is still getting reported for fiscal year 22, but it's not gonna be for fiscal year 23. So, you know, um, like you can decide uh, with your districts on how they want to address that, if they want to go through and actually make sure they're putting all of the detail of these in there. Um, but here, let me show you where this is. So if they had them in classic, they were imported from classic into this EMIS fund category field. Um, you can search for them on the account grid. Um, we'll go ahead and look at this in a minute. And um, basically the codes themselves, like there's not like a drop down and redesign, but they can refer to that list in the EMIS manual and then enter these in um, if they choose. And then if the EMIS fund category is required, but the list of options don't apply, they could enter an asterisk um, in that field instead. So let's go back here. So see this EMIS fund category, I have it on my grid. I, in my test instance, honestly, none of these were filled out. Um, but if I go ahead and open one of these up, and um, it's right here, it's this first under the standard custom field. So if that is something that they're wanting to enter, you know, maybe they have um, most of them entered you know, for a lot of their funds already. So they want to just go go ahead and um, make it consistent for like any new ones they've added. They would just go ahead and type um, in here the fund category. And the search um, that's suggested in the PowerPoint. So if you do like a less than greater than sign, that will find any that are not empty. So um, all of mine in my instance are empty, but that's your little quick search to go just look at the ones that have the EMIS fund category code. All right, so next is reviewing the um, operational units. This is under the core menu, um, or you could run the OPU listing report. And a couple things that you want to verify here, the IRN numbers, the um, entity types, and, um, you know, make sure that um, if, the cent if it's a central office building, then it should be checked. Um, these, again, probably something that are already set up, they would have come over from classic, you know, but if they have had changes, 
then uh, this may need to be something that they review. Again, it's being used with the EMIS extract. So, you know, your account codes have those OPUs attached to them. And then this is a way to then go ahead and for them to connect those to an actual IRN. Um, so this can be really helpful when it comes to building expenses. Um, so just basically um, the step is checking those over and making sure that those are all accurate. Um, for appropriations, so um, use the budgeting scenario option to enter the next year budgets and revenue estimates. I have a direct link here to our walkthrough um, that has the budgeting scenario steps for creating those proposed amounts. Um, it goes through the scenario page and the proposed amount page, how those work together. So that's why this walkthrough is you know, really helpful because it gives all of those steps and the different options there. We also have talked about budgeting a couple times recently. Um, you know, we've uh, done our best to move that earlier in the year, try and make sure that we're getting you that information. We know districts like to start doing that, you know, quite ahead of time. So um, our budgeting session, Fridays with Fiscal, we did a full session in February. Um, and then day two of the beginning overview training was more of like a brief overview of that. And both of those can be found in recordings um, on our training pages where um, you would find, you know, typically, typically find the recordings. Um, the beginner training, that one has links to like the specific sections where we talk about either scenarios or proposed amounts. Um, and of course, if, if there are questions on that, um, let us know. I know that's a big one for the districts. And hopefully they are like on their way of budgeting, um, you know, at this point. Now, once they're starting to get the budgets in, the other thing that they're thinking about is preparing requisitions. So um, requisitions can be entered for July 2022. Um, in redesign, um, you know, entering there, the posting period must be open for July. So um, you would go into the posting period, the core posting periods, create July, have it open. Um, it does not need to be the current period. So your current period, um, can still reflect May, but just having um, June and July out there and created so that it has, you know, that folder to be putting those transactions in um, is needed. Um, now, so as far as budgeting goes, like, okay, I know budgeting is fairly complex. I just referred to those whole, you know, sessions that talk about it, but when it comes to requisitions um, and even like, you know, if you're entering them in redesign, if you're entering them in a third party, I believe it still can use the next year proposed figure. You may need to check and see on um, that end. They may need to like flip something on. But once they get through the budgeting step and they're, they get their budgets into that proposed amounts grid, as soon as the budgets are in that proposed amounts grid, then that also puts them in the next year proposed field on the account code. So being there is where they need it to be able to start, you know, entering the requisitions against those budgets. Um, so once they get that step, that is something that's possible. Um, my next bullet point here says no budget yet. So if they're not to that step, that, um, then people could start entering requisitions. They don't require account numbers. So they could like enter them without the account number and then enter that later. Um, obviously that's a certain choice that, you know, they'd make if they wanted to do that or not. Um, but it is possible. Um, and then um, as far as the option to assign account numbers later, you know, if that is something they do, you know, here's the report um, in a way you could um, help them review that to get those added later. Okay, so those are my beginning steps. And Amanda, yes. Hi, this is Vicki from Naoman. Hello. Um, hi, quick question. If someone is going to enter the account numbers later, then they would have to go into those requisitions and edit each line item to add mm -hmm. that account number. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. Yep. So if so, they would edit the requisition and then they yeah, and then they could um, select like an account code for each one. Okay. That's what I thought. I just, mm -hmm. 
think that's a whole lot of work for somebody. It does sound like, I, so like this option is, I don't know if I see this happening as something as like a district that has like, you know, a bunch of people entering requisitions. Cause you're right. That does seem like a lot. This is just like, if they don't have the budget in yet and they do want to start entering them, it's a, it's an option, but I think it is likely that, you know, they're probably already starting to work on their budgets. And if they have those in, then they can, you know, can enter with an account code um, like normal. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, let's see. Yes, so um, I have a, a message in chat that's saying, you know, if they, if we're in May right now, and then this is saying they must open uh, July must be open. They will have to open June first. You have to open those periods in order. So um, I know we're a little bit early. You know, we are doing this, you know, in May. So we have some time. So if they're doing this, you know, right now, then yes, they'll open June, then they'll open July. Um, and then, you know, the other thing, I'm so sorry, I'm just going to take a look for a second here because I'm not sure. If my PowerPoint got moved around. So I had a slide for this, but I'm feeling like maybe I accidentally moved it. Nope, here it is. It's right there. Okay, never mind. I'm getting ahead of myself. We're gonna talk about that's about the um the federal assistance. We'll talk about that later. I thought that was a pre-closing step because I feel like they could do that, but you know, I think I just need more coffee. Um, okay, let's make this big again. Amanda, before yes. you move on, um, <clears throat> this is Mary at Laca. I have a quick question. If they have the rules as uh, false on um, checking future requisition amounts, um, then they could go ahead and put in, even if they don't have their budget scenarios, done and their next year proposed, they could go ahead and put in the requisitions anyway. With Good the point. Accounts. Good point. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. If okay. they don't have, if they don't have checking on, then it doesn't matter. I think maybe we could probably are, adjust our slide there. Um, and, you know, this is kind of like the general practices one. So if you are using this for um, your districts and you want to go ahead and edit that one um, based on, you know, how, you know, your districts do it, please feel free. Cause I think that, you know, as, as, um, we've gone on with redesign too. It's kind of difficult with requisitions because everyone does them so differently. You know, like you might do them in redesign, you might do them in a third party. Um, they might have budgets, they might not. Um, but yeah, that user-based balance checking is the mechanic that actually would do, um, would have like a warning or an error. And that does require it to A, be turned on. So if the district is using user-based balance checking, but also there are a set of rules that determine what those balance check. So if they do not have future year, like future rec balance checking on, then they are free to enter with or without a budget because it's not even going to look. That's that's what I'm, and then you said that um, they have to, if they promoted their scenario or if they have it in the proposed, don't they have to promote the scenario? Yes. So okay. let's hop to the software real quick. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about here. So, so um, they have the scenarios, right? So like they made the scenario and then when they do this, they promote it. And when they promote it, this is like very quick, very quick budgeting crash course here. <laughs> um, when they do the promote, it goes to this proposed mounts grid. Once it's in this proposed amounts grid, this is when they can use it. So let me. So they don't have to apply it in order they, for it to be available. Correct. Correct. Oh. For just for for the next year proposed. So okay. um, here, I'll show you what I mean real quick. I'm just going to write down this. Um, OK. So see, I have this first account here that's got this um, 28,000 in it. So it's in the proposed amounts. Now applying it, so that's an option here, but say I did not do that yet. Um, if I go to my accounts,
Okay. So now I'm going to look at this account here. And is this my right one? It is. Uh, am I in the wrong year? Oh, dang it. Okay. Well, I picked, I, I was looking at one that was in the wrong year, but that's okay. We're just going to readjust here. Okay. So this should be the right year here. So now for 2023, we have a proposed amount. Now, did not apply that, just totally entered that in my grid. Okay, and when I look at this, so this next year proposed field right here is what I'm concerned about. That's what ha that's where it goes. When it's in that grid, that's where it shows. And so if they are entering it, you know, for like for the next year, it's going to look at next year proposed. If they're using a third party, um, like, and again, like not official information from us, but just from like working with, you know, um, different like ITCs, like different questions that I've had. Um, my understanding is that um, they can use this. There may just be like a setting where they have to say like, you know, uh, they have to set it up to be able to accept those for the next year. But I believe that it will um, compare to this figure since this is next year. Um, but now this just sits out there um, and can be used for that. The step of actually going in the proposed amounts and applying it what that is going to do is it's going to go actually make the entry that'll have it be the initial amount for July. So I need to apply these in order for them to be the initial amounts when I get to July of next year. That's what that step does. So it doesn't really impact my like next year proposed holding, but um, if I don't apply those, then when I switch over to the new year, I won't have a budget. So that's the difference there. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so let's get back to it. Um, thank you for the questions. I'm um, always, it's always good to talk through those things um, when we're together like this. Um, so our next step is just the month closing. This is pretty standard process. We kind of just list out all the steps here, um, entering all the transactions for the current month, um, reconcil reconciling the records um, with the bank, um, just to highlight here, this, I can't, click, I'm sorry, <laughs> trying to click on my PowerPoint. Um, I'll just go ahead and um, gesture to it here is under the periodic menu, the cash reconciliation. So you do want to make sure to fill that out for uh, June. That should be um, entered in all other months. It's optional, but they do need to enter the cash reconciliation for year end so that that can get reported appropriately because that goes with the extract. Um, and then um, this last step, generate the cash summary report and the financial detail report and um, balancing those out to uh, match the totals. Honestly, this is really, this is their standard month end process. Whatever they do in a normal month end, this is kind of um, suggesting they go ahead, balance their books as per usual. As far as monthly reports, uh, you know, again, uh, they can run and review any desired reports that they um, would normally use for, to balance out. Um, once the period, once the posting period is closed, the monthly reports, uh, the SSDT monthly reports bundle will run and um, be sent to the reports archive. Um, if they do, so we talked earlier that they have the option where they could go ahead and schedule like custom custom bundles that would also run when the month is closed or when the, the year ends closed. So uh, this is just basically saying that uh, this is kind of like the general month end information with, uh, you know, wait until one bundle is complete before closing another month. Um, 
when we actually get to the fiscal year end part, I'm going to talk specifically about closing those fiscal year end months. So this is more like general info here. Um, but once the reports do get run, they can be viewed under the utilities file archive. And then just, um, you know, if you wanted any of those bundles to be turned off, there is a disable um, bundle or like a disable uh, checkbox that they can use. And uh, mostly this is like, you know, if they were like reopening and closing months, like um, sometimes they may want to disable those because individual reports can't be deleted from the archive. So just be aware of that, especially if they're setting up custom bundles that will also go to the archive um, there. Okay. Here is a list of the different month end reports that are included in the bundle. This is kind of just a, hey, you know, like if you need to refer to this, these things are in here. I'm not gonna, you know, say them all, but um, these are your standard month end reports that are included in that bundle. Okay. Now we're on to this uh, fiscal year end closing. So as I mentioned with the month end stuff, confirm the cash reconciliation for June has been completed. And um, that is gonna be under the periodic menu, cash reconciliation. Uh, they can come in here, they can create, or um, you can um, like open a previous one and then clone that if they have certain things, if they do use this monthly, or maybe even like they just use it yearly. Maybe they just do June. Um, but so if they come in here and create one of these, they just want to go through, this would be June, and then enter in um, their information here. And down here, it brings in the fund balance. So um, they would want to have that balance. And this, this goes with the EMIS reporting. So that's why they have to do it for June, even if they don't do it for any other month. Uh, the federal assistance summary and the federal assistance detail. So these are also things that go um, with this EMIS extract. And um, this is some standard information that they may enter um, for the current fiscal year. There is a big note here that the summary option does need to be completed before the detail. And we'll see why. Okay, so the summary basically sets up the fiscal year. So when I create this, I'm going to enter the fiscal year. I probably should have checked to see if I had this already. I do. Um, but this sets up the fiscal year and then um, basically just some very standard information. And when I go to this federal assistance detail and create a record here, I have a drop down for the federal assistance summary option, which year am I linking it to? So if I don't add the year first, then I won't have a year in this drop down. So they can't really mess it up. If they accidentally come into detail first, then they don't have the year that they need. They're going to know that they need to go into summary. But um, just a note for a reminder. And then um, line number, CFDA, um, the grant title, and then they can pick a cash account to link this to. And um, then um, some of these are able to populate as well. So basically they're just coming in here, entering this information um, for um, the different ones that they need to enter in here. Um, let's see, I believe I just have a couple notes on this. Just a second. Okay, so um, with these, I, I was trying to find my exact note, but you know what? I uh, I'll just I'll just tell you. <laughs> so the CFDA, um, I believe we had some requests for like including uh, the alpha characters because sometimes when they see these, it's like the um, numbers and then it'll have a character afterwards. 
And so we've, um, we've checked on that and um, we've not gotten like the approval to add the numbers to our system. So if they have one that has a new, like, um, sorry, an alpha char character after it, like they just enter the numerical value, they don't enter the alpha character, but that is something that um, we've checked on, we're checking on, like if that changes, we'll change it in the software. But so far the direction um, that we are at at this point in time is to leave it with the numerical characters. Um, the other thing with these, so, um, I believe we have this, I believe I have a note on here. Um, so they can enter these. Yeah, I have this note additionally. I'm so sorry. I've been reviewing these, fed, the federal assistance detail, because I know that this comes up, you know, this is something that they just do at year end. So this is usually when we get the questions on it. Um, so let me show you back into software. So on here, you can get a report from the grid of this. There is a report that um, can be run from the report manager. And then there is a report that runs in the monthly bundle at year end. Now, these records, you can have records for multiple years in here. When the EMIS extract runs, it will pull the ones for the proper year. Um, however, the report that goes to the um, file archive, it is going to include everything in this grid, but it doesn't include the year. It's something we have on the list to update down the line, um, you know, once we're able to fit that in. So if like you really, um, so the options basically would be the, they could run the report separate um, and keep a copy of that if they wanted. It can always be run later. Um, or, you know, if they wanted to delete like the previous years out of here, you know, and change those to the current year when they do this, technically that could be done. But if that is, um, you know, too big of a pain, there, there are ways to go back and get that report. So just kind of a heads up there. It is something we're aware of, um, but just to, you know, also kind of let you know as well. Um, and then the last one is the civil proceeding. So let's just go there while we're still in the software. Um, so again, this is just something that they enter that goes with the financials, they would enter if they have civil proceedings, they might not, um, they would enter, excuse me, the fiscal year, and then, um, you know, the, the number, the, the uh, court case number, they'd have all of this information if it's something they need to, to enter. Oops. I think I'm not sure if someone is um, trying to speak, but I'm um, hearing like some broken audio. So I'm so sorry if I can't hear you. If you're trying to ask a question, please put it in the chat because I don't want to um, miss anyone's questions. Um, oh, good question, Rhonda. If there are no civil proceedings, do they need to enter a blank record? Nope. No, they do not. I know in classic, there was like some weirdness with these things where they still had to like go into it and just tab through it. They don't have to do that in um, redesign. If there's nothing, if they don't have them, they just don't even have to go here. It's not a problem. It's a Vicky says it still gives a warning though. So I'm assuming that's in the data collector, maybe that they don't have any. Yeah, but that should be like uh, one that they can proceed past, I believe, but I could see it, you know, potentially giving a warning to say like, hey, they don't have any, just so that if they should have some, <laughs> they would get alerted to them. <laughs> yeah, Amanda, it used to be on the classic that when you went in and came back out, if you didn't have any, you wouldn't have a warning because okay. it kind of showed that, that you went into that field to verify that you didn't have anything. But now with the redesign, you can go in and out of it, but it still gives that warning when you do that um, collection. So, gotcha. but it's just a warning and, and you can proceed past it. Gotcha. Okay, perfect. Okay, so then this next part is just um, about making sure the EMIS SOAP service um, configuration. We're going to talk um, on the next two slides about actually configuring that SOAP service real quick. Um, 
So in the system configuration, there is this EMIS SOAP service configuration. It's very simple. It just has the fiscal year. This um, configuration right here is what controls which year the data collector is pulling. So once you get this all linked up, this fiscal year here, so like um, you'll want to go and make sure that this is fiscal year 22 so that when they start doing their financial pulls, it's going to be pulling fiscal year 22 information. This is also helpful because if they close their fiscal year in July, you know, at the start of July, but they still have to do a financial pull after that, as long as this still says fiscal year 22, they're still able to pull that information. So um, configuring the SOAP service with USSR, um, we do have a page in the wiki for this, um, if you need to refer to that. Um, Again, the, this mentions that configuration that we just looked at. And then um, you would create a user in USSR. And um, so here's kind of an example. It shows like, you know, a sample username, and then that's got um, an email SIF role. And then um, here is an example showing that there would be like the SOAP endpoint is a URL. And then within um, the, the um, I believe this is the, the SIP zone. Um, so here is the configuration for the SOAP connection over here. So this is the URL um, that we saw on the previous page. And then the username and password is what was set up in USAS that has that emissive role. And so that is basically gonna allow it to use this uh, user to connect and pull the specific information um, related to the accounts uh, into the data collector. This isn't something that you have to set up every year. This is something that gets set up, you know, possibly even when they uh, migrate over, or you know, maybe it's something that is done like the first year after they migrate over the first fiscal year, because this is when you need it. Um, but this is once you have this set up for a district, then it's good to go. Okay, so then under the extracts menu, um, you would select EMIS, click on generate the extract file. It has a fiscal year. You wanna make sure that says 22. And that's gonna create this USA EMS underscore 2022 sequential file. And that would get uploaded. Um, that would get uploaded to the data collector for period H reporting. Um, now that is going to work with the USAS SIF agent for the collections. And um, here we go. So the EMIS extract contains the same data as Classic's partial file. So this has the cash rec, the federal assistance, civil proceedings, all of these things that we just talked about. It was kind of like the supplemental information. But um, so that's what, when you're doing that EMIS extract, that's what's included in that file. It's not the full file. It doesn't contain the account information. That comes directly through that SIF pull. So the SIF agent is going to pull over the other files listed here, um, the account information, uh, the operational units, and um, like the, the actual like figures basically is going to pull directly through SIF. And that ensures that it's like pulling the exact up-to-date stuff right from the system. Sorry. Um, okay. So the fiscal year end reports. So now here we go with like, okay, so we're getting started on actually kind of closing and balancing everything. Manually run and review um, any desired reports not included in the fiscal year reports archive. Uh, the fiscal year bundle will automatically run when the period is closed. And as always with those bundles, you want to make sure the bundle is complete before changing the current posting period to a new period especially if there are custom report bundles scheduled. Uh, reports can be viewed under the file archive. 
Um, and, and you'll see here that we have, there's the different tabs in here. So the monthly reports archive is under the first tab. Fiscal reports will be under a second tab. Make note, the monthly bundle will still run for this month. So all of the reports that would already apply to like a monthly, like the budget summary, that's going to run for the month. But of course, like for June, that's also kind of like the fiscal year end snap. So you will have the monthly report and the fiscal report archive. And so the fiscal report archive are the things that run in addition to a normal month for fiscal year end. So um, there will be things in both places. Oh my gosh. Okay, here is a list of um, the reports that are in the bundle. So here's where you can see the federal assistance reports, civil proceedings, if there are any. Um, this runs some um, reports that are relevant to the full year. So those are included in here. And then as far as actually closing the fiscal year. So um, this one, we have the steps pretty specifically laid out here. Uh, create July 2022 posting period. Now, obviously, if they've um, already created this so that they could start entering transactions, they're good to go on that step. But if they haven't, if this is a district that didn't open that in advance um, to have things entered in there, have them create it first. Um, this is kind of like uh, just like um, a just in case feature, uh, just in case step. Uh, we saw some weirdness uh, last year with districts that like hadn't created July and then had closed and then created it. There are so many things happening at fiscal year end. It's trying to roll over figures just to be safe. I would just go ahead and suggest they create July 1st and then um, don't make it current, just create it. So now when they close June, um, they would click to close June, the monthly report bundle and the fiscal report bundle, those are definitely going to automatically run. So give it some time, let those run. If they have custom bundles on top of that, they may you know, need to wait um, addition, you know, some additional time. They could um, open the um, job scheduler to keep an eye on the bundles, or they could uh, go to the file archive and just ensure that those are completed. Um, but once all of their bundles are good and completed, then they can make July 2022 current and then um, they are closed for the month and the fiscal year. We do have this noted in the actual checklist too, as far as um, these steps, um, you know, with this order as well. Okay, so we've made it to the post-closing procedures. Um, do we have any other questions about that closing process before we um, get onto this last part? Alrighty. So scheduling the audit jobs for AOS. So this is new. We have talked about it. Um, oh, I, I uh, see. Wait, we have a question before we move on. Is there something that shows the bundles are done? So yes, the job scheduler will show um, when those uh, report bundles are running. It'll show um, the job um, as it completes. Now, it does depend which user and which bundle we're talking about because the SSDT bundles, like those are, um, those may need like a certain level of access to see them. But I would say that really the sure go to is, you know, if you uh, go to the file archive and then look at the reports there, then they can tell, you know, then they can um, see when the reports are, are populated. If they have custom bundles, then um, it kind of depends on like, you know, if they are emailing them or if they are sending them to the archive, if they're emailing them, then, then the job scheduler would be the, the go-to. Okay. Um, so these audit jobs, um, these are new. We talked about these on the release recaps recently. Um, so the, the one of these um, audit jobs is the district audit job. 
And the district audit job, it contains these extracts, the, the auditor extract for accounts, transactions, vendor, it contains a cash summary and the gap extract. Now, this is something, so we used to say like, oh yeah, run these extracts, send them to the auditors at the end of the year. Um, but that's basically what this job does and what it can, um, what you can do or what they can do is they can schedule this to run um, based on a cron job. So maybe that's at like a certain time of year. Now, these run, when it runs, it'll generate reports for the previous fiscal year based on the current period. So once they're in July 22, if they schedule it to run any time after that, it's going to look at fiscal year 22 and, and run, generate the reports for those. Now, when they schedule this job, it can um they can set it so that um it'll run it'll um send reports to their file archive it's going to um there's going to be audit reports in there there's a good se separate tab for it and so that they could um, view or pull the reports from there also when it runs it's going to automatically um securely file transfer a copy right to the right to AOS, right to the auditors. So I see this as something probably they'll want to set up for uh, like when their general like audit time is, you know, they don't have to go in and do this like immediately after they close the year, they don't have to go run this right away. Like it was kind of like, a, you know, standard thing where it's maybe like something that they did in the process of closing before, which is why I kind of added this in here to address it. But this isn't, you know, it's post closing something that they can, they could even just wait and schedule it when they need it. The financial reporting. So um, this process is done through EMSR. Uh, it's a responsibility of the district to um, report their, uh, to complete their financial reporting. So an authorized person in the district, whether that be their EMIS coordinator or the treasurer um, would go into the um, SIF data collector and then upload that supplemental file that we talked about that had the you know cash rag and the federal assistance information, and then um, also do the poll that pulls the financial information um, through the through SIF, um, and then that must be sent to ODE before period age closes for the fiscal year. I'm sure that they are. Um, this is something that they keep tabs on. Work with their EMIS coordinators. Um, for, but that is something that they'll do, you know, post closing um, at some point, you know, before that deadline. And then just a note here, uh, this has been like this for a couple years, but as of fiscal year 20, uh, capital assets are no longer needed and not to be included in the data collection. So there used to be like the financial, uh, like period uh, had to be reported by this date. And there was like a supplemental period where they could also have like time for their capital assets. They'd have to report inventory information. They don't have the supplemental period and they don't have to report their inventory information, their capital assets um, to ODE anymore. Okay. <laughs> Um, we went, I went and looked at this. This is just a draft schedule posted online. Um, this is, I um, pulled this, maybe it might've been a couple weeks ago now. These change all the time. So uh, please don't just take this. This is an example. This, you know, if you wanted to go look it up, this might help you, you know, direct of where to go. But, um, you know, here's their draft copy of the timelines for the financial collection. This is on par with like where it usually is. Um, the financial collection that we're talking about um, is set to close at the end of August. So, um, you know, check for updates on their website um, or email announcements, you know, if that if that date might change, you know, this is a draft copy. So don't just believe me, but here is the information that I was able to find when I went out there. Okay. Um, and then just some additional notes. Um, so this, and you know, we kind of kind of talked through this, but just really kind of um, making sure that this is clear, this is like um, clarified is that 
Um, so the district is going to upload this is the sequential file. So that's the USA EMS underscore the fiscal year. So they'll go in, there is a part in there where they can like upload data files. And so they're uploading that information. Um, but when they actually go to run the collection, um, they're going to select USAS SIF agent as the actual financial source. And then that's where it's going to go in, pull the account information. Again, this works with the configuration where the fiscal year is set. So that's the other thing that's like why they can, you know, use it directly through the SIF poll. Now, I know, I think in classic, some people used to go take like the, you know, the actual extract file instead. And so that's where, you know, this is different now in, in redesign where they need to um, actually be pulling the account information with the SIP zone. Okay, and then um, gap. So running gap from extracts menu to create the file for gap reporting. This one super easy um, under the extracts drop down. All they do is select the fiscal year and then hit submit and it's going to go ahead and generate the gap um, export txt for them. And if they need to email that to um, somebody who's responsible for uploading uh, their file to web gap, they can just take that file and send it um, as needed. Um, here's some information related to gap the gap URL and the gap wiki. Um, this is just for reference. And um, do we have any other questions for USAS? Okay, well, um, we're gonna switch over to USPS in, um, in a moment here. I do just at the end of uh, my little PowerPoint here have a list that um, shows our upcoming trainings. So I mentioned earlier, you know, in this USAS portion um, with like the classic, we did uh, inventory with USAS, but with redesign, we split that out because inventory being new this year, um, there's a lot that I think Michelle um, wants to go over and just make sure that we have the adequate time to talk about it. And, you know, I know these meetings can be a lot <laughs> with all the different applications. So um, when everyone is fresh next Friday, um, we'll go ahead and do that inventory fiscal year end review. On June 3rd, we'll continue our monthly reviews with May releases. And then um, these are the use, these are specifically the use as uh, Fridays of the fiscal um, outside of the releases that I have on here. So June 10th. We're going to be talking about tips and tricks for AP invoice processing. So I'm just going to go through and talk a bit about, you know, the um, with invoicing, like um, different things that you can look at or, you know, updating invoices. I know that even just with like the PO and invoice process, there have been um, different questions on those. And um, we're just going to kind of compile like FAQs and look for some tricks to, to talk through that together. Um, to help there. On um, July 8th, we have the June releases. July 15th, Pat is going to talk about requisition workflows. So we're going to have a session um, just dedicated to that. So if that is something that your districts may be interested in using and, um, you know, or if you have already started to set those up, you know, then that would be a good session um, where we're going to kind of overview it. And uh, July 29th, so this one, I'm very excited for reports and report bundles. I know we get a lot of questions on reports. I know um, like our feedback is, you know, you, you guys always want more training on those. And I think especially now that like over time, we've really, you know, tweaked things with reports. We've started to add canned reports, those report bundles. Like I said, I've gotten a lot of like, you know, uh, questions, instances that I've seen where people are really using these report bundles. And so I just kind of want to do a whole session talking about, um, you know, the different kinds of reports, how to set up those report bundles. It can just be so much when we do it in like a beginner training even or, you know, in, in other trainings where we're only really able to kind of touch 
um, part of the reports. And so that's just going to be our time to go a little bit more in depth with it. So I'm very excited for that. And um, <laughs> here I go, you know, uh, going off about trainings, but um, but I hope you all are just as excited about these as I am, because I think that this is a great lineup and we hope to see you there. Um, but I don't see any other questions coming through in the chat. So um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. And then, you know, let's go ahead and do, um, let's do like, maybe, uh, Lori, are you here? I don't know if we want to do like a five minute break, a 10 minute break. What do you think? Probably just some time so everyone can stretch their legs while we get switched over. Sure. Maybe um, like start back up at 10 20 will that work that's perfect okay all right well we will see you all back at 10 20 we're just going to take a quick pause here thanks amanda thank you so i want to welcome everybody um the powerpoint that we're going to talk about go through this morning um i wanted to point out where that can be found um if you're not familiar with it I'll bring this over here quick um it's actually on the ssdt um, wiki page. So as Amanda mentioned, if you're on um, from the beginning, um, if you go to SSDT meetings and trainings, um, we have a section on the wiki page um, called redesign. And what we're going to focus on this morning is obviously the fiscal year end information. So if I click on that, on the right hand side um, are all the um, fiscal year end information pertaining to the payroll side. So we have a couple um, documents that you're gonna wanna pay particular attention to. Um, one is the actual PowerPoint that we're gonna go through this morning. Um, the other is the fiscal year end checklist. And then we have some other supporting documents that, that I'll point out as we go through um, the, the, the actual closing um, process. But I wanted to point out where that information is just in case you weren't familiar with it. When it comes to the actual checklist, um, I wanted to point out it's changed just a bit. Um, we tried to um, put in a lot of detail as far as steps um, pertaining to each report that might you might be running um, at particular times. Um, you know, it's broken out by pre-closing procedures, month end quarter end, and then, um, sorry for all the scrolling, and then obviously our actual fiscal year end um, closing. So this morning, we're not gonna go into great detail when it comes to month end and quarter end. Um, I'm gonna point out a few things that might be different based on this time of year, but for the most part, the, the month end and the quarter end are just like you know every other month or quarter um, that they're closing um, throughout the year. So we're not going to go into great detail. Um, again, that detail is um, within the checklist. So, you know, if they're balancing their clearance account, um, we put steps, um, you know, to help them um, do so um, in that those particular sections within the checklist. Okay. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started on the actual um, PowerPoint and the, the actual procedures. Um, you know, just uh, uh, to point out, this is just our general, um, you know, procedure. You at the ITC level, you know, might have your own um, specific ITC specific checklist. So, you know, just make sure that your districts, you know, are following your checklist um, and not ours because there are, you know, times where things might, um, differ um, between the two. And again, as I just um, referenced or took you to, this is just pointing out where um, you might find the information that we're going to talk about this morning and a, a direct link to take you to that specific point on our wiki page. When it comes to pre-closing procedures, there are, you know, a few things that um, districts can be doing ahead of time. Um, and we really strongly encourage that so that it helps minimize um, problems, um, you know, or, or eases their burden a little bit later. 
Um, one is processing those life insurance premium payments um, now. So um, we'll talk about that. Um, run the STRS advanced reports now. We cannot encourage this enough. If they're running these reports now, um, it's going to prevent a world of headaches later. Um, and we'll go through, you know, why that's important and so forth and how they can, um, you know, maybe head up any, any problems um, before it gets to too late. And then lastly, you know, going in and verifying that STRS advanced figuration, configuration, excuse me, um, screen is, is ready to go for this year. And that that's cleared out from um, last year. So first, um, regarding the cost of life insurance. So again, you know, any cost of life insurance above and beyond $50,000 um, needs to be reported on the employee's W-2. So if they're, re if they're retiring, you know, at the end of the fiscal year, um, we do want to make sure that that payment or that cost um, gets processed now um, to avoid any, you know, further adjustments um, at the end of the calendar year when you're working on um, W-2s. Um, there is uh, an actual um, sample and it, it steps you through the cost and how to calculate that cost um, in the IRS publication 15B um, in specific, um, you know, pages 13 through 15. Um, specifically address those um, that cost of life insurance and how to calculate it. Um, there's a link here um, to take you right to that publication. Um, we also have that. That's one of the supporting documents we have listed on our wiki page as well. So again, once you've calculated that cost, um, those life insurance um, pay types can be added to either future or current. So here's just examples of, you know, again, um, using that pay type of life insurance premium, um, the cost then, and then, you know, unchecking that applies for retirement box because it doesn't apply to retirement. Um, if they forget to uncheck this box, there's a message that appears that, that alerts them and says, you know, this type of payment is not considered, um, it doesn't apply for retirement. So they will have to uncheck the box. And then here's an example then in current, also adding that life insurance pay type um, to um, you know, a, a pay for the employee that's already included in the payroll process. Okay, pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Um, so once that life insurance then is processed as um, that type of payment, um, it does get added to the total and applicable gross um, this is for W-2 um, purposes. It does not um, withhold federal, state, or OSDI taxes. It does withhold Medicare and FICA. And then the city um, withholding is actually based on that payroll item configuration um, option. There's a tax non-cash earnings checkbox. And here's an example of where that is located then on that payroll item configuration screen for the city. So if that box is checked, the tax will um, be withheld. If it's not checked, then it does not withhold city tax. But this flag here, this checkbox is what determines um, that city withholding. So if um, the pay type was not entered prior to the employee um, being paid for the last time, so it got missed, it's now after the fact, it's too late. Um, it really isn't as difficult as it was in classic, I don't feel. Um, they actually just need to go to um, core and then adjustment, and they're gonna make um, an adjustment for the federal um, pay, uh, payroll item, excuse me. The type will be life insurance, and then they're gonna add that um, amount, the cost of that life insurance um, amount. So again, um, W-2 report will add that to the total and applicable gross for the federal, state, OSDI, and Medicare. Again, the city is based on that payroll item configuration, um, that tax non-cash earnings checkbox. 
And then if the Medicare withholding was paid by the employee and or the employer, um, adjustments need to be created. So again, here's making the adjustment to the federal record. And then here's adjusting for the employee portion of Medicare if the employee and the employer um, the board side was paid. Here's how it would look then if they had Medicare pickup and it was strictly, you know, all paid by the board. Okay. So just a note here, um, just keep in mind that life insurance premium pay types, those are not included in the total gross that gets, you know, um, charged to USAS. So it's not included in any payroll submission that goes over to USAS and gets included in um, you know, the, the disbursement that's made. Um, there are some reports that actually aid in balancing and they have that those um, non-cash earning totals listed out. Um, those are the pay report, the pay amount summary report, and the quarter report. So those are um, you know, specifically outlined in those three reports so that that does help um, you know, the district when they go to balance. Next, um, it is encouraged that the districts run their STRS AD reports. So just the reports only. We're not gonna create any submission files, obviously. So just make sure they're running the report options of their non-advanced position report, their advanced positions report, and then the advanced fiscal year to date report. So I've, I've kind of, you know, for those of you that are, are kind of still getting familiar with, you know, the classic terms versus the um, redesigned terms, I've, you know, outlined those um, here as well. So the non-advanced position report is the non, the non-AD, non-ADV text file and classic. So all those positions that will not be advancing are listed on this report. The advanced position report, that was formerly the STRS AD text file in Classic. And then finally, the advanced fiscal year to date report, that's the STRS AD report in Classic that lists everybody um, that had any STRS withholding throughout the fiscal year, okay? So just to kind of get a comparison of, you know, what those were, um, what those equate to in Classic. Again, you want to you know, make sure that your districts are running these reports now and pay particular attention to this first report that's listed. So if they run these reports now, they look at their non-advanced report. If all of their teachers are listed on that, something probably happened on their first pay of the fiscal year. 99% um, of the time, that's what it always comes back to. So maybe they've migrated and um, in classic that they missed purging contracts at the right time. So work days got missed on their first pay. Um, that can all be corrected now if they run these reports ahead of time prior to their final pay in June. So say they run these reports now, all their teachers are listed on their non-advanced reports, a non-advanced report. Maybe they're missing, you know, a couple work days. What they can do is go to that teacher calendar, add a couple work days on the weekends. So a sad, a non-work day, I should say, which is typically um, a weekend. Um, they can add those missing work days to that calendar, run, process their payroll. That's going to update the on the compensation record, the days worked, as well as the amount um, due or the amount earned, which affects the amount due. And then they can go back to the calendar after those days have been accounted for, compensation has been updated and remove those work days from the calendar. That's the easy way to fix, you know, when records are listed on this non-advanced report, um, you know, groups of people, I should say, and they shouldn't be. So that's why it's so important, you know, really encourage your districts to run those 
these reports now. Um, if they're not balancing them, you know, to the penny, that's fine. But especially look at this non-advanced position report and make sure that those that are, you know, only those that should be listed on that report are the only ones listed. Okay, there was a question that said, can't they just do compensation adjustment to the work days to make them equal? Yes, absolutely. I'm more saying for groups of people, um, I don't know that you weren't gonna wanna do that for every single teacher in the district. Um, so if it's groups of people that are listed, pay groups, probably teachers, um, then you can go the adding the work days to the, the, the calendar that that group of people is pointing to, that corrects lots of people at a time. If you just have you know, a handful of, of um, employees that are listed on that report and those are you know, specifically didn't advanced for some reason, then yes, definitely you can go to that compensation record um, and use a compensation adjustment to adjust just those select few. But we probably don't wanna be doing that for you know, groups of people. So that's, that's what I was um, trying to get at. But yes, Tammy, absolutely. Okay. All right. So those are a few things that you can be doing ahead of time, um, you know, to make sure that you're um, ready to, you know, process fiscal year end um, after you get through month end and quarter end. When it comes to month end, um, again, as I, I mentioned earlier, we're not going to go into great detail about um, month end. This is something they do, you know, 11 other times throughout the, the year. Um, it's really not any different. Um, they're going to balance their payroll clearance account. So maybe that means um, they get a file from their bank and they're using the automatic reconciliation um, of their checks. Or, you know, they're, they're manually um, going in and reconciling checks and then they're balancing their um, payroll clearance account that way. Lori, you have another chat question oh. out there. I'm sorry. So compensation adjustments won't get picked up for retirement purposes. So if you if you post um, if you post a compensate, I think I understand your question correctly, Andrew. Um, if you make an adjustment to the compensation, if you post a compensation adjustment, let's start over, that will update the days worked and um, the, which in turn affects, you know, then you're going to want to update the amount earned, which affects the amount due. Um, as far as counting it for a day of retirement, um, that will not affect retirement days. So if they're missing a day um, for retirement purposes, then you will need to add that, you know, on the calendar or at an attendance day um, to pick up that retirement day. So I guess basically I was talking about, you know, trying to get those that should be advancing off of the non-advance report and then on the advance report, but that's not going to affect service credit per se, um, if that's what you're asking, Andrew. If I'm not understanding your question, please feel free to. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. I'm, I'm not good about looking at the chat, so I apologize ahead of time. Um, please feel free to unmute yourself and, and interrupt me at any time. Okay, so back to month and closing. Um, so again, you're gonna be, they're gonna balance their payroll clearance account. They wanna process if, the, if there are any monthly um, payables. Um, I don't know how, you know, there are monthly payables and usually, you know, they're selecting those by pay cycle. So they're selecting that monthly pay cycle and processing those maybe with their last pay of the month. Um, then they can go back in their outstanding payables and just verify and make sure that there aren't any outstanding payables. And probably, um, you know, at this point, um, 
you know, if, if you're if you've processed all your monthly payments um, and your quarterly payments, then you know there shouldn't be anything in your outstanding payables, so that grid should be blank. Next, there's some optional um, reports that districts can run. Um, one being the STRS monthly report. So a lot of districts run this to help them balance their STRS payments on a monthly basis. Um, ST, SERS, excuse me, monthly is another option. Some districts also run the census report. So that gets um, you know, an extract file that the districts can use to upload to ING. Um, if, if they use that for um, their annuity um, annuities. And then the afford report. So this again is for um, the Affordable Care Act reporting um, those hours um, to that, maybe their third party administrator. So those are all optional reports that they can run um, to help them again, balance um, and get their month end reporting done. If it's the appropriate time, they can also process their benefit accruals. So they're under processing, there's the processing benefit um, accruals option and they can process those if um, it's the right um, you know, time. Every, every district varies when it comes to that stuff. So when it comes to quarter end closing, we'll move on to that now. Again, there's really not um, much different um, outside of a few optional reports that I want to um, point out that might pertain to just this time um, frame only. Um, they're going to want to run their balance, their quarter report, and balance that. Um, they do this, you know, three other times throughout the the the, the year. They want to run their W two report, balance that. We recommend that they do that on a quarterly basis, so that when it comes to W two reporting. You know, it's it's a matter of running that for the final quarter and they balance their fourth quarter and, you know, things then um, should be fairly easy for them um, when it comes to um, balancing um, calendar year in time. They again just, you know, want to double check and make sure that all their outstanding payables have been um, paid so that outstanding payables grid should be blank. They'll balance all of their board paid payroll items. So if they're tracking those and paying those on the system, you know, we advise that they balance those and um, make sure that um, you know, what, what they actually paid matches what the system um, says they should have. There's you know, lots of different um, forms and submission files. Um, you know, outside of the system that the districts have to complete for their cities, um, for the state, um, you know, they want to make sure that all that those quarterly forms and submission files are done. Next, they're going to balance and submit their ODJFS reporting, which again, they do three other times throughout the year. So that's not any different. Um, I did want to point out the next um, several bullets on um, the checklist. And I'm gonna pull over the checklist. <clears throat> Sorry for the scrolling here. I'm gonna go down to the quarter in closing. And we actually have these reports outlined in detail excuse me, in steps 17, 18, and 19. So um, I wanted to point out the Auditor of State reports because we've actually added uh, um, an additional Auditor of State report um, that districts will want to include in the email that they send to um, the, the, UR, the um, web address that we've um, included in the checklist. So they're going to want to, they, they'll run under reports. There's the auditor of states reports, and now you, they'll see two options. So there's the employee report and the payments report. So they actually want to run both of these, save those, you know, somewhere on their computer um, or in a file on their computer, and then they'll use this address 
And in the subject line, they'll use um, the IRN, followed by the year, followed by USPSR, and they'll send those two reports then to the Auditor of State's office. Okay. Next is running the SERS liability report, again for the auditors. This time they're gonna run the report and they just wanna save this for um, later use. When, they're, when they have their audit, um, the auditors are gonna ask for this. So we do ask that you run this, that they run this now um, and then save that somewhere. And then that can be you know, easily accessible um, when the auditors ask for it. And then lastly is running the surcharge report. So this one oftentimes gets, oftentimes gets missed and there's really not an easy way to recover this information um, later. So we do ask, even though it says optional, you know, make sure you point out to your districts that it is easiest to run this now, save it somewhere. And then um, that way when the time comes and they're working on their SERS surcharge, um, the, the bill that they get from SERS, they can you know, easily, you know, again, access this report um, to use with paying that. Um, I think I looked, I think the surcharge amount this year is $25,000, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so it has went up from last year. Okay. All right. So again, you know, not going into great detail when it comes to month end and quarter end because that's something that they should be familiar with doing because they do it, you know, more than once throughout the, the year. So we're going to focus on. Or you have a question on chat. What's it? Uh, is a surcharge payment due by? That is a great question. I did not look up the date, um, but I can. Melissa, let me make a note of that and we can look it up and see um, when we can let you know. I don't know if the date has changed from past years, but I will, um, I will be glad to look that up. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on then to fiscal year end. Um, and that's what we're gonna you know, really focus on today um, and go through it in a little um, more detail. So some things to consider before they actually start. Um, um, I lost my train of thought. Before they actually start their actual fiscal year end closing. Um, do they have any docs? So are there gonna be docs over the summer months? Are there gonna be any early contract payoffs? And I know sometimes you know, it's inevitable that they don't know this, but if they do know this information um, ahead of time, then we can actually you know, use the system and put this information in, and then it's, cons it's gonna be um, considered when they actually run their STRS advance reports. So when it comes to docs, they can actually go to future, so payroll payments future, and then put in that pay type of doc and the doc amount, and then run their STRS AD reports. And the doc amount is actually taken into consideration um, in the calculations. So if they would happen to know this ahead of time, you know, have them enter this information and in future, run their reports, run their submission file, and then obviously they want to delete this information out of future before they actually process their first pay in July so that the docs don't happen. Um, and then they'll re-enter those um, in future at the appropriate time, okay? Um, the payoffs, contract payoffs, um, if they know ahead of time that a contract's gonna be paid off, they can actually go in and change the, the pays in contract on the compensation record. And the system again will 
um, calculate then the correct um, figures when it comes to their STRS advance reports. Okay, just a note, you know, anytime you change the pays and contract, it's likely going to change the paper period. So you just want, they want to be conscious of that and make sure that that, um, you know, is correctly um, updated. The first step then, um, when they're ready to begin their actual um, closing, is to run and balance all of the STRS um, reports. So they're going to go to reports, STRS reporting, STRS advance. There are three reports, and we kind of already touched upon um, all three of those. But here's, you know, when you're in the actual STRS advance report options, those three reports that the district is going to run. Um, let me back up. They can sort this, um, you know, whatever makes most sense to them um, and, and is easily, you know, the reports are easily um, verified. They can actually um, generate these in multiple formats. So the PDF version is going to be the pretty version that they probably, you know, will want to use to when they're balancing and verifying information. Um, it can also be downloaded in Excel um, if they would choose to um, look at the information that way. The start and end date. So, um, you know, I know there's there's discussion on what should this date be. Um, you know, the we've always said that it's the first work day, you know, teacher work day. Um, I don't know that it really does any harm in just entering the fiscal year. Um, I've not had any experience that that's caused any problems. And I know some districts like to enter this just in case they have contracts that do start that are certified prior to that first teacher work day. Okay, so the dates here I've, I've shown you are the fiscal year. So first you're gonna wanna verify then these three or I'm sorry, run these three reports so that they can be balanced and verified. So the advanced fiscal year to date report, this is a complete listing of all those STRS employees for the, any STRS employee that had withholdings um, throughout the fiscal year. So there's some bullets here that we've, um, included in the PowerPoint and also in the checklist of what, what makes up, you know, what criteria does an employee have to, to meet in order for them to appear on the report. So they have to have a position with the retirement system set to STRS. So on the position record has to be STRS and that um, retirement code field. They have to have earnings within the, the fiscal year. What are considered earnings? And we've outlined those as well. Um, for an advanced compensation, the accrued wages are added to the, the earnings and we've provided that calculation um, as well. Adjustment journals with the type equaling total gross and the payroll item code equaling either 591 and or 691 for the employee with a transaction date within the fiscal year, okay? And then lastly, the applicable gross of the historical STRS pay item paid to the employee on payrolls that were not imported from Classic and have a pay date within the fiscal year, those are also added to their earnings. So again, you know, kind of complex, hopefully spelling it out says, you know, helps a little bit um, and saying, okay, I don't know, what does it mean if an employee has earnings in the fiscal year? These three bullets are exactly what the system is looking at to, to determine the employee's earnings. They also have to have a contract or legacy compensation with a date range that falls within the current date and the compensations paid paid is not equal to the pays in contract. So they have to have remaining pays left. 
or the compensation has to be paid within the fiscal year, or the employee must have a non-contract compensation with a date range that overlaps the fiscal year. It's a lot, right? <laughs> um, but hopefully, if there are questions on, you know, why is or isn't an employee included on the advanced fiscal year to date report, hopefully spelling out exactly what the system is looking at to include or not include somebody, you know, this will help you just go through these bullets and, you know, and, you know, capture each, each step and um, see if it meets that, spe those specific criteria or it doesn't match. So here's then just a, a sample of, you know, the information that's included in the report. And this obviously is just a snippet of towards the bottom. So there's just one employee listed and then the totals. Hello. Hi, mom. Okay. So when it comes to the report itself, they first want to verify the, the percentage of credit. So if I back up here, you know, the service credit is, list, is listed in a column. They, they want to verify for every employee um, that's receiving or not receiving credit, is that accurate? So employees with 120 days or more, they will receive 100% of credit. Employees that do not have 120 days, that's then based on the um, STRS's decision tree. If an employee is flagged as part-time and that flag then is found on the 450 record and here's a, a, a snippet of what that, um, what we're, the field we're talking about, then it uses, again, the STRS's decision tree to, to you know, determine the percentage of credit. Here's the link um, to STRS's website that um, will take you right to the service credit section and then also the decision tree. So if there's questions, um, you know, you districts can refer to that um, section in the STR, on STR, STRS's website, um, you know, and hopefully that helps them, um, you know, with questions they might have on um, the service credit part. You know, if you get questions on, you know, whether an employee should be classified as full-time or part-time, um, you know, we always recommend that they reach out to STRS for that um, and they can help them make that determination. You know, it's not something that, um, you know, us at SSDT or probably you at the ITC level, you know, want to determine for them. Okay, so when it comes to um, balancing the report, we're going to balance the service credit part, and then we also want to balance the totals at the bottom. Okay, so in the reports total section, um, there are several totals. We're going to go through um, and talk about each of these. Um, we've outlined in the in the PowerPoint what exactly um, the system is looking at to determine um, the grand total that's listed. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, you know, the non-tax earnings section, you know, it's looking at the fiscal year to date gross amounts from the 450 records plus the accrued wages. Um, the non tax advanced amount, you know, that's looking at their retirement amount that will be withheld on the summer pays on a per pay basis um, per the compensation um, record. So each of these sections, I don't need to read. I don't think each of these um, to you. Um, I did want to point out that the taxed sections, these are, are likely going to be listed with zero amounts because these are not, they're, they're not common. So most generally, I don't know if anybody does not, any districts um, tax their um, retirement. Um, if they did and they don't have the annuitized type, then that would be listed in these two sections here. Um, but these, you know, most generally the tax section should be listed with zero dollar amounts, okay? So in the, again, in the PowerPoint and also in the documentation, 
um, we've outlined exactly what these totals, how, how, where to go, you know, what, what the system is using to make, to, to, to um, list the totals you see on the report. So hopefully that's helpful if, you know, if you're not sure, um, reference either to the documentation or to these, um, this PowerPoint, and it's gonna spell out for you um, what makes up those totals, okay? Again, I don't know that I need to read each of these, you know, bullets to you because you can all do that yourself. Okay. All right. Next, we'll move on to the advanced positions report. So this is only going to list those um, employees that have an accrued contribution calculation. So only those positions that are going to advance will be listed on this report. So again, we've listed that criteria. Um, you know, what, how does the system determine an employee with an accrued com contribution calculation? So one, they have to have a position with the retirement code set to STRS, and the position must have a job status of either active or inactive, okay? Um, next, the employee must have a contract or legacy compensation with a date that falls within the current date. So it's, you know, everything in the system is date driven now. Next, the compensation contract work days must equal the contract days worked or it will um, as of June 30th. So, you know, if they run this report now um, and um, there are work days, you know, not all their um, pays have been processed as of you know, at, through the end of the fiscal year, the system is smart enough to look at the job calendar that those positions are pointing to and then count the remaining number of work days through June 30th. And then that will get added to the, the days already worked to determine whether they are, you know, those two dates, two values equal or not. Okay. The work days must be greater than zero. And the pays paid must be less than the pays in the contract. So if the pays paid and the pays in contract are equal, the job will not advance. So there have to be a remaining number of pays. And then the compensation obligation minus the amount paid minus the amount docked must be greater than zero. So basically there has to be a remaining amount to be paid on the compensation. Okay, these are very sim. This is very similar to classic. So if you're familiar with that, the process of you know jobs or positions advancing is is the same. Okay, so here's just again um, a snippet of the total, the bottom um, you know portion of the advanced payment report. Um, you would obviously have way more. Um, the district will have way more employees listed. This is just the bottom that gives you a sample of, you know, one employee and then the report totals at the bottom. So keep in mind that the system does um, calculate the advanced amount on a per pay basis. So here's a sample of the, um, you know, employees obligation, the pay per period, and then there are a remaining you know, number of pays. So the system is gonna figure out then the 23rd, the 24th, the 25th, and the 26th, and then add all of those amounts up times 14% to come up with the total, okay? So it does calculate it on a per pay basis, add all of those amounts up, and then that's the, amount that gets advanced. So just keep that in mind that it's not, you know, it doesn't take the total times 14%. Um, it does do it on a per pay basis. And then obviously the 26 pay, um, you know, is the rounding is the, the cents. So that, you know, amount's going to differ based on the remaining amount to be paid um, on that contract. And it, 
you know, paying off the cents on that final pay. Okay. All right. Um, this is just something that I, I thought might be helpful for districts. It's not anything that they have to do, but um, with the grids um, and the, the ease of you being able to, you know, create reports from the grid, um, districts could use the compensation grid and add the, you know, I've listed some columns that they might have to add to their grid that might already, they might not already have added. And then they can filter the grid by the last paid date and the retirement code, um, you know, equaling STRS. And then capture that report in Excel. And that's going to give them then uh, a nice report of all the STRS employees that um, their paper period. So you could they could take their paper period times the remaining number of pays to come up with quote the advanced amount. Um, now it might be off, you know, cents because of that last pay. Um, but then they can take the STRS the advanced positions report that in Excel as well. And then they would have the STRS advanced amount that the system is calculating. <clears throat> if they're really good at Excel, they could use VLOOKUP, merge the two spreadsheets, and then calculate the difference in what you know, you're saying the advanced amount should be for each, each um, position versus what the system is calculating. Um, in that advanced positions report. And you could do you know, a um, formula on the difference to make sure it's not some obscure amount. You know, if it's cents, it's probably you know, obviously gonna be the last, that last pay and a rounding issue. Um, I know every district has their own way of balancing um, you know, the advance. And you know, I'm not saying that this is the greatest way ever, or this is the only way, but because the grids are so easy to use, you know, you can, let me pull this over here quick and I can kind of show you what I mean. Let's see here. So you can, you know, go to the compensation grid and most generally, you know, your your advanced positions, I would think, are going to be the contract compensation type. So you would go to that tab. And then again, you know, make sure that you have, you know, the ID or I'm sorry, the number, the employee ID. If that if you are going to use VLOOKUP um, to merge the two, you know, this is going to be um, needed. Um, you're going to have to have some kind of column to actually, in both spreadsheets to actually, you know, use VLOOKUP. So you could use the ID, the last paid date. So you could enter, you know, um, the fiscal year and then, or, you know, the last pay of, of um, the last pay that they processed so far. And then the retirement code um, equaling STRS. So then if you, if you um, use the report option and you captured that you know, using the Excel data option, they could then you know, use that spreadsheet to maybe help them balance their advanced employees. Okay, just a thought, um, again, um, you know, I was trying to think you know, through an easy way to help um, districts balance those figures um, and the grids again are so easy to use that I thought well you can certainly use the compensation grid um, and, and grab a report using the, the report option there. Again districts have lots of different ways their own ways to balance that so just you know something to keep in mind. Okay the non-advanced position report again um, you know, this is the report that's going to list all the positions um, that will not advance. So 
Um, what you know, criteria does a position have to meet to, to be included in this report? Um, the position will have a retirement code set to STRS and a job status of active or inactive. They have to have a legacy or um, a contract compensation. I'm wondering, okay, so really the difference is the, the days down here, I'm like, did I mess up and, and not put this slide in correctly? But the work days will not equal the days worked. So that's the, that's the key. So, you know, again, that's why it's important for districts to run this you know, prior to their last pay in June, so that if they do need to fix those um, days worked, then it can be fixed before it's too late. Okay. And, you know, if, an, in, if districts have um, questions on whether a position should be advancing or not, it's always really recommended that they reach out to STRS for that advice. Um, you know, they've, they've always said, you know, be consistent. You know, whatever you've done in the past, um, you know, keep doing. Um, but, you know, we, we probably want to direct them into point them to um, call STRS to determine, um, make those final decisions. And here's an example then of the non advanced position report. So, again, is, you know, everything on this report accurate? And for the most part, you know, it's probably just superintendents, um, maybe principals. Um, you know, I, I'm, this list should not be very long um, because most generally all of your um, positions are advancing. So again, if you have pages and pages and all your teachers are listed, then the district needs to, you know, obviously that will all need to be fixed and by running that report before the last pay in June, um, it can be easily corrected. Okay. The STRS advance chapter um, in the documentation um, is super helpful. So it, it goes through, you know, each report, it goes through the criteria that we just talked about and that are included in the, in the PowerPoint. It includes all the error messages. So, you know, really, you know, use this chapter, um, you know, and, and have your districts, you know, have this bookmarked um, when they're going through fiscal year end, because it is, um, you know, quite helpful in, you know, all these, uh, all the STRS advanced um, processes that they're going to, reports and so forth that they're going to go through. So here's the link then that they can use um, that'll take them right to that chapter. Okay, um, once all the STRS advanced reports have been verified and balanced, um, they, they can print these reports um, if they like. I know old habits are hard to break, so I probably would be one of those that wanted to print my report, even though you know they have access to them, um, which we'll talk about a little later in the file archive. Um, you know, some, some people like those hard copies um, and they want to file them away and that's fine. So they can do that. Um, the next step then is to create the submission file. So they'll go to reports, STRS reporting, um, under STRS advance again, and they're going to now um, click the generate submission file option. So instead of clicking the reports option, they're going to click the generate submission file option. This is gonna do um, a few different things. One is it goes out and it checks the STRS advance box on the compensation record. So all those compensations that are advancing, it's gonna check that box for them. And then as we'll talk about in a little bit, that kind of protects those um, records and allows certain things to, to be done or not done um, on those um, compensations that are flagged as in advance. It also goes out and it updates the STRS configuration, um, the STRS advanced configuration screen. So it's gonna check the boxes on the compensation records 
and then it, um, it goes out and flags the district being in, adva in advance. So it's going to check this advanced mode box. It also places the total advanced amount in the ad advanced amount field. Okay. As the pays over the summer months are processed, you're gonna, the districts will see this field here, the amount paid back increased um, each pay. So we'll talk about that here in a second. So when they create the um, STRS submission file, it's going to create this STRS AD, the year followed by the year followed by 06, um, that txt file. The districts will want to submit this then as their annual submission file. They're going to um, submit this to STRS. However, if they have a third party file that they need to be, you know, include that needs to be included with their file from the redesign, they don't want to upload the file yet. Okay, there's a couple extra steps they want to do before they. Um, click that upload um, to STRS option. So there's now um, a nice handy dandy merge option um, also on the STRS advance screen. Um, and it allows those two files to be merged just with a couple clicks. So the option that says upload advanced submission file for merge, this they're gonna click choose file and they're gonna to browse to find that STRS AD, you know, 2206 text file. So the file from the redesign. The next field that says upload file to merge, this is their third party file. So they're gonna, again, have that saved somewhere on their computer. They're gonna click choose file. That then, um, you know, once those two files have been, um, uploaded, they would click then the generate STRS merge report option. They first want to obviously generate the report and they're going to verify that and make sure, you know, the totals look good, the information on the, the report, you know, includes everything that they're expecting. If it looks good, then they're going to click merge files. That's going to combine the two in the file format that STRS is expecting, and then they can upload their file. Okay. So here's then the option that they would choose when they're ready to upload the file. They browse to find that file, and then they're going to click submit uploaded file to STRS. Okay. If you don't have a file that needs to be merged with any kind of third party, then you're, you're simply ready to upload that file to STRS. So again, you can skip that merge um, part that we just talked about, and you're gonna go directly to the upload submission file option Click the choose file, browse to find your file, wherever you save that uh, on, on your computer. And then you can click in the upload submission file option, submit loaded file to STRS. Okay. So in just a couple clicks, your file is sent to STRS. Um, there is back on the configure STRS advanced configuration screen, there's actually um, a submission tamp timestamp field that will tell you um, the, the date and the time that that file was submitted. Okay, so if districts have questions about, um, you know, whether that file was actually uploaded and submitted or not, they can always go back and reference this STRS advanced configuration timestamp field um, to see that yes, it actually was uploaded to STRS. Okay. Um, I did want to point out the deadline um, for the annual report is it's always or it is it has been the first Friday in August. 
So that deadline this year, if I looked at the calendar right, um, would be August 5th. So districts wanna make sure that they have that file to STRS um, you know, somewhere prior to August 5th. Okay. So when the submission file is created, um, then that fires some reports to be um, generated in the file archive. So when they create the submission file, um, if they would go to um, the year fiscal year end reports option in the file archive, all of the fiscal year to date reports are should be out there and, and accessible for them to, to go back and, and look at reference print, whatever um, they need to do. Okay, so that's what fires the, the STRS advance reports out in the file archive. The next step then that the districts wanna take is to actually, they're pretty much done with their, um, their year end closing. So they wanna close June. So they're going to click on the icon to close, um, you know, that posting period. What that does then is when they close June, that fires other reports to be copied out to the file archive, again, within the same folder. Um, but all of these reports listed, that's when those reports get um, generated and copied out to the file archive. Okay, so two different groups of reports get copied out in that same folder um, at two different times. So I just wanted to point that out um, so make you aware when you know those report bundles get fired and, and copied out. Lastly, then um, they're going to then create their July, you know. 2022 posting period, and they just go to core posting period, um, select July 2022, and then they can check the box to say, yes, make this um, month current. And they are ready to um, process then their first pay in July. Okay. There's a few things that I wanted to point out, um, you know, when the districts are in advance, a few things to consider. Um, they cannot use regular or irregular pay types. Um, so those cannot be processed on any um, position that's in the advance. They can use um, a doc, the back, the TRM and payoff um, of accrued pay types, but they just wanna keep in mind that those could cause balancing problems. So those are um, pay types that you know they can use, but um, they're going to want to you know consider that when they go to you know make sure that their STRS advance balanced um, that those can cause discrepancies. Modifying the number of pays paid can also affect the STRS advance, so that's why you know we talked about um, before they. Um, run the STRS advance reports and begin balancing. If they know of any contract payoffs, you know, they, it is advisable that they change those then and then run the reports because the, the STRS advance, um, you know, should be um, calculated correctly. If they're not, then, um, you know, they just want to keep in mind that that will affect um, the STRS payoff. Um, during each payroll, then, um, the fiscal year to date amounts on all the retirement records, so the 450, the 591, and the 691, um, will list advance and new earnings, okay? So it's going to list both of those. And then lastly, um, just to point out that on the pay report, um, each time, you know, each pay at the bottom of the pay report, there is um, an advanced amount listed on that report. And you should see that where it says payroll item STRS advance. You can see then that that amount, you know, for that specific pay, um, you know, that totals there for them, um, you know, for their reference. 
Then like we touched upon just a, a minute ago, you know, as they're processing their summer pays, um, going back to that configuration option, they're going to see this amount paid back increased by that total that we just saw on the, on the pay report. Um, and then you would hope then at the end of, after the summer pays are all over, um, that this amount here, the amount paid back equals the advanced amount. That means that everything balanced, it will automatically take out, or I'm sorry, uncheck um, this advanced mode field and blank out these two, um, the advanced amount field and the advanced paid back um, field, okay? So here, there's a bullet just saying that if it's equal to or greater than the advanced amount, then the district is no longer going to be in the advance mode. Um, it also unchecks. I don't know that I mentioned that on this um, bullet. I can add it. Um, it will uncheck then also those compensation records, um, the STRS advance um, checkbox. Okay. If the amount paid back, so if this amount here is less than the advanced amount, then that means that the district unfortunately did not you know, balance. So what they reported on their annual report was not exactly what happened over the summer pays. So how do, how would, how do districts go about you know, figuring out where there might be balancing problems? Um, one great tool is running the um, checks STRS advanced report. So that's on the homepage. Um, they wanna make sure that they run, sort that report in the exact sorting um, order that they ran the STRS advanced position report for. Um, and then they're gonna need to go through employee by employee and then compare you know, where those differences are, okay? So once those differences are determined, then there's a couple things that the districts need to do, that the district needs to do, I'm sorry. One is to report that um, to STRS. So they're gonna report that those corrections to STRS um, as prior fiscal year corrections. And then they're going to, oops, what I did there. And then they're also going to need to post um, adjustments for the fiscal year um, because those amounts are gonna still be included in the fiscal year totals. Um, so, you know, we have screenshots here of the total gross and then the amount withheld and those then strictly just applying to um, the fiscal year. So you can correct those amounts then on the system as well. Um, when it comes to the, you know, what you need to do on your end at the ITC level, um, you'll want to then uncheck that advanced mode box. Okay, so if you go back to the STRS advanced configuration um, screen, you'll want to uncheck the advanced checkbox, and then that will zero out then the advanced amount and the uh, amount paid back fields automatically. Okay. The other thing that will need to be done is making sure um, that all of the compensations are taken out of the advanced mode. So basically unchecking that STRS advanced checkbox um, so that you know, those um, contributions going forward are not flagged as prior year contributions when that file gets sent to STRS, okay? So if, if there's just, you know, one or two or, you know, a handful, it might be just as easy to go to um, the compensation grid and then, you know, make sure that that STRS advanced field is added to the grid. Um, and then you can just search by that field, that column equaling true. And then you can just simply edit those few compensation records go to that advanced STRS advanced checkbox and uncheck those, okay? And then I would just, you know, again, double check and make sure that, you know, refresh your, your screen and make sure that there are not any compensations with that 
STRS advance um, field equaling true. If there are several um, and you don't want to, you know, manually one by one um, go through those and um, do those individually, update those um, fields and those records individually, you can use the mass change option. Um, we have a STRS advanced definition dash false. Um, that's actually, um, it's linked in the STRS advanced chapter that I talked about in the documentation. And it's also on our wiki page. So there is a link to that um, report definition. Um, you can download that um, and then use that um, in the mass change option, import that, and then use that to set um, you know, all of your compensation records to false um, in a couple clicks. Okay. Um, when it comes to errors, um, you know, it kind of depends on where they're at in their payroll process. So if districts discover errors and they've actually um, not processed a pay for um, next fiscal year, then it's a little, um, you know, it, it involves a little, um, you know, tweaking on the ITC level, um, but you can actually take them out of the advance by simply unclicking that advance mode checkbox on the STRS advance configuration that we talked about. Um, so you'll uncheck that um, advance mode box. Um, you would either, again, filter the grid, like just like what we talked about, um, edit those records and uncheck that advanced mode or STRS advanced field or use the mass change definition that we talked about, that STRS advanced definition dash false to take everybody out of the advance. Okay. They would then rerun, basically they're gonna start over. So they're gonna rerun all of their reports. So they're gonna verify that, you know, all of those three reports that we've talked about are correct now they would regenerate their submission file, and then they would upload that submission file to STRS. Okay. If there has been a payroll that's been processed um, and um, the file was created, then they really, the only correction, the only way to fix it is to reach out to STRS and make any corrections with file any corrections with them um, on their end, okay? All right, are there any questions? I do see there's one. You have to run the mass change to edit even one. No, I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear. So there, it's kind of an either or, um, Amy. So you can either go to that specific um, compensation record, and then just uncheck the box, the STRS advance field. Um, so that's kind of what this bullet is saying. Or if there are several, then you can use the mass change definition to change multiple in just a couple clicks. Does that make sense? Lori. To follow up on that question, you said it was an either or type of uh, way to take people out of STRS advance. Mm -hmm. Didn't in the past, if you went to the configuration and unchecked that advanced mode, that it would automatically take everybody out of advance? Um, I am not aware that it worked that way because we've always had you check that to make sure that everybody was out. Lori or Andrea, are you on? Can you verify that? Because I know we've always had yeah. gone, go to the grid, filter the grid, you know, and- it, in, in classic Lori, it was, it was iffy. I mean, because a lot of times, even if they were out of advance, they would still show as advanced on the job screen. 
So you had to use uh, data retrieve to go in and take them out of the advance. So it's kind of similar in redesign what you're doing with that mass change option as far as taking making sure that that compensation is set to, you know, not basically not set to advance any longer after the fact. Because if they basically truly show that they still owe money, um, they're going to still show as advance. And so you have to take them out of advance if the advance is completed. Yeah, I would recommend, I mean, if nothing else, double checking um, just to make sure that everybody, you know, came out of advance or, you know, that box is unchecked for okay. everybody. Otherwise, that's just going to cause more problems. Problems than, and yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, just to be sure. I do think, Lori, I do think if even if they have one person that's marked in advance on the compensation, you have to use that mass change feature. I don't, I don't okay. think you can uncheck it manually. I think that's one of those crazy feels that you can't, you can't, it's like restricted. It's okay. untouchable. So you have okay. to use mass So I stand feature. corrected and I apologize for that. No problem. Um, so you will want to use that mass change definition and I, I'll update the PowerPoint to take, remove that. Um, but again, you can use the grid then once you, once you do use that mass change definition, you know, use the filter your grid um, based on that STRS advanced field, you know, equaling true and you shouldn't have anybody listed. So that's a, you know, way to. Sort of like a safety net. Yes, exactly. Just double and triple check and make sure that, you know, it's, it's, you're seeing what you expect to see. Okay. So, and then, I'm sorry about that. I, the, I, no, please. Everything changes. <laughs> I mean, daily. It, it just, everything changes daily and trying to keep up with it. Um, but I do have one other question. I'm sorry sure. to take up everybody's time. Oh, you're um, fine. You, uh, and I, I'm sorry, you don't have page number, so I can't tell you the page number, but um, back where you show the adjustments to the total gross in the 450 record. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's the exact one. And that is to, if you find, um, if you don't balance and you run check yes, STRS um, and you can uh, isolate who the uh, problem employee yes. is, yes, you need to do this. Why? Well, if you're, there's still going to be, if you found a problem and if you would run reports, they're still going to show the same amounts on the report because you haven't fixed it on the system. You, you corrected it maybe with STRS, but on the system, it's still going to show whatever was originally reported. Okay. Makes sense. So um, you have to, you would, you know, you would want to correct that on the system because if you ever, if you rerun the report, you're going to get this same result without doing the corrections. The corrections. Okay. Okay. So, you know, you fixed it with STRS. If you ever run anything to match what you reported to STRS with the system, the two aren't going to match unless you post the adjustments. Got to it. Just, just to just adjust the fiscal year to date amounts that you reported to STRS. All right. So after you discuss this with STRS and there, you guys are going to come to the figures that you're going to use. And then those are the figures you're going to use on, on these adjustments. Yeah, exactly. Got it. So Got that it. It, the, the two systems balance. Match. Got it. They'll be in balance. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry yeah, to bother you. Yeah. No, 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 no bother at all. Thank you for the question. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. And I'll get, I'll get that updated. I apologize if I misspoke there. I, I wasn't, didn't obviously didn't know that. Um, so we talked about the errors. Okay. So we were to the questions part. Does anybody else have any questions at all? <clears throat> Okay, I did want to point out, um, Amanda pointed out um, some upcoming Fridays with Fiscal on the USAS side. Um, I wanted to just leave you with some upcoming Fridays with Fiscal on the payroll side um, as well. Um, so June 3rd um, will be the review of the May releases. And as Amanda mentioned, if you were on when she um, did her part of the presentation, you know, we've started breaking those out into monthly um, Fridays with fiscal. So we're going to touch upon then in June, um, all of the information that was just pertaining to the May releases. On June 17th, so sort of related to what we just talked about this morning, 
Um, we're going to, Lori is going to do um, a review of the STRS advance and balancing tips. So just kind of, you know, diving a little deeper into what we just discussed um, this morning and focus on, you know, maybe some tips and tricks and um, balancing tools and how the reports, you know, more specifics of how the reports are working and what they're looking at to, to um, capture their totals and so forth. So probably, you know, something that will be of huge benefit then um, as you get questions, you know, from your districts about um, STRS balancing in the advance. And then July 8th, we'll do um, a recap of the June releases. July 29th, um, we're doing a session on reports and report bundles. August 5th, we'll review the July releases. And then something I also wanted to um, wanted you to pay particular attention to is August 12th, we're gonna um, do a session on all things um, relating to the payroll side of EMIS reporting. So we kind of took that out of the presentation today just because it is so much information thrown at you at one time. Um, so we're going to have a, a special, you know, Fridays with Fiscal that pertains just to EMIS staff reporting. So there might be um, other members of your team um, that work with the EMIS side of things that you might, you know, think that this would be helpful um, to them as well. So please invite any and all um, that you think, you know, would, would be would benefit from um, this type of session. Okay, so those are some things that we have um, on our training and registration page and things that you can look forward to us um, meeting with you on in the near future. Are there any other questions before um, we finish this morning? And I apologize because we are way later than what we said, <laughs> so. Okay, if you have any questions at all, you know where to find us, you know how to reach us, um, you know, we're here to help you. Um, and we look forward to talking to all of you very soon. Um, and have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy the beautiful weather. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.